Learn, Speaking and Learning and Optimization of Static and Dynamic uh, Appointments. <laughs> <laughs> right, so thank you for inviting me. I do not have to come from very far, so it's particularly pleasant to give a talk in Berkeley. Um, so this is some joint work with uh, two students, Gary Chang, who is an undergraduate student, and Kabir, who was undergraduate at Berkeley and is now doing a PhD in Stanford. One of the traitors, but uh, probably good for him. I want to thank also Raoul Jain, who is somewhere here, I think. Uh, we started working on these problems together. We were motivated by uh, hospital scheduling. And we noticed that in uh, surgery departments, the scheduling is very inefficient. So there are many periods of time when the surgical team is idle because some had the surgery finished early and they are waiting for the next patient. And so that has not been uh, planned uh, correctly. And we know also in hospitals that there are many delays. At the end of the day, everything is delayed, and people end up waiting for hours for their surgery. So we thought there is something to be done there. And we worked with a, a doctor at Children's Hospital in Oakland, and uh, he gave us data and also access to the actual uh, people managing the teams and so on. And I also worked with uh, some other colleagues here. So. Okay, Bing. Um, all right, something is not working. Okay. So uh, the, the problem is can be described very simply. You have customers who make appointments with the service provider. So for example, you make an appointment with the plumber to come to your house or with a dentist or a repairman or some surgical team, right? Uh, the, the features of the problem is that the service times are random. It's not like talks here that are well metered by Bruce. <laughs> the service times are very random, and that's the cause of the problem. Uh, so you could space out the appointments to reduce the waiting time. Right? So you space them out enough, that, that will be very good. So you'll reduce the delays of customers, but you'll increase the idle time of the service provider and the overtime. So that's not a good solution. So the problem is to find a, a good uh, trade-off. And this is a, a classical problem. So one way to formulate that is to say, well, it's a multi-objective, right? We have delays, we have waiting time, so, and we have overtime. So let's m minimize the expected value of a linear combination. So you'll find the Pareto envelope of uh, right, what you need. Okay, so a practical look. Okay, the old approach to do appointment scheduling was to tell the patient, well, come to the hospital the night before surgery and uh, you would be sure that the surgeon would not have to wait for the patient. But of course, the, the patient would have to wait for the surgeon. Or well, the plumber will come to your house between 8 and, and noon, right? So you would wait uh, starting at 8 o'clock in the morning, and he would show up at 2 in the afternoon, right? So that's <laughs> okay. So the new approach tends to be dynamic. So the, you tell uh, the patient that we will call him two hours before he should be at the hospital. So you get a text or you get a phone call. Or the plumber will call you one hour before he gets to your house. So you, will, you have time to drive from your office to home to, to meet the plumber. So the theoretical questions, okay, if you want to optimize static assumptions, uh, appointments, say that given the distributions of the service times, so you have n service times, you want to find the appointment times that will minimize the expected cost, the expected cost being this linear combination. Dynamic appointments are a little bit different. You say, well, given the distribution of the service times and the required advanced warning times, one T to Tn, that may depend on the, on the customer, find an adaptive policy to notify customers when they should come to the hospital or when they should go home to meet the plumber. Right? And you want to minimize expected cost. OK, the fact is that there is no nice analytical property of the optimal solution. This is a, the static appointment problem is a well-known problem, and people have tried to prove conjectures about maybe the, the concavity of the, the time between appointments uh, or the, some other properties, but it turns out that you find counterexamples to all the conjectures. It's, it's very difficult. Numerically, it's very hard. So if you, you could think, well, let's use dynamic programming, but if you think about it a little bit, you realize that it's intractable because 
the state of the system at any given time, in the case of dynamic assumptions, is when you gave warnings to the people before. Right? So you imagine you have the, that vector of warning times that becomes part of the state that becomes very um, difficult to deal with. Okay. The pragmatic considerations also are that you don't know the distributions. So even if you knew them, uh, the problem would be hard that you don't know them. Right? So what you, in fact, know is that you observe samples of the surface times. So you can tell that this particular surgery, we have done 100 of those surgeries in the last uh, two months. We have observed samples. Uh, the distributions change over time. So for example, the server gets better, or tools, new tools become available. So if you look at the uh, hip surgery replacement, right? hip replacement surgery two years ago by a given surgeon, and you look at it now, well, it takes much less time. The tools have improved, the surgeon has improved. It, it's uh, substantial. Uh, so a suitable goals would be for us to have a model-free approach and that is adaptive. So that's what we try to do. Okay, a bad approach that is used commonly is a form of certainty equivalence approach. So what you do is you, you look at the expected duration of the service. So the hip replacement surgery, you say, oh, the average is four hours. And then you schedule for four hours. Then you, how do you schedule for those durations? Well, it's a mixed integer linear program. It's not difficult to write down and solve it. It's, why is it bad? Well, it's because the cost based on mean durations is not the mean cost, obviously, because the, if you know, the, if you assume that the durations are fixed to their mean, then there is no waiting time, there is no idle time, everything is perfect, there is no cost. Right? So clearly, that, that does not help too much. You have to deal with the variability. Okay, okay so what will we do? We do um, first the, the static case. To explain the problem, I explain the traditional approach, which is the linear programming formulation, and then how we do it. Then I will talk about the real time scheduling, which is, uh, uh, I think, a new formulation of the problem and, and a new, new solution. Okay. So, what is the problem? So, imagine that you have five customers that you have to serve, and those are the service times. They are random. What you do is you decide appointment time. So maybe the start of the day will be the first appointment. Right? Then there is an end of working day, so you try to finish everything before the working, the end of the working day, and you choose those appointment times for, for number two, number three. So, so assume for now that the order is fixed. We have decided ahead of time the order. Okay, so this is what happens, okay, the, the first appointment you finish here, well, you finish early. The second uh, customer shows up, well, you finish a bit late, right? Then the third one, well, the third one, the, pay, the customer arrives here, but you start serving him when you have finished the second one, and, and so on, it continues like that, right? So you see there is some idle time. And there are some delays. So this is the delay of, that is faced by the third customer, the delay that is faced by the fourth one, delay that is faced by the fifth one. And also there is some overtime. So that's what you try to, you try to minimize the linear combination of the idle, the delays, and the overtime by choosing the appointment times. Right? The difficulty again is that everything is, is random. So the idle time is idle time prior to the last case. The idle time after the last case does not matter, obviously. Okay, so an example. You have two, two just to, to anchor the model in your mind, right? You have two cases, the durations, let's say, are IID, and let's not worry about overtime, right? So why should you schedule the appointment time of the second customer? Well, you see, if you... You, if the first service finishes before the appointment time, you have a delay, uh, you have an idle time. So you have a cost, which is the, the idle time, which is the appointment time of two, minus the, the, the duration T1, right? So this is your cost. If T1 
one happens to add after the appointment time, you have another cost, which is a delay. Right? So the delay will be uh, T1 minus A2. It's a simple model, right? So assume that alpha is 1. So what you see is that the cost is just the absolute value of the difference between A2 and T1. Right. So how do you minimize that? Well, we know we should take the median value of T1. That will be minimizing the mean absolute value, right? And uh, the cost then will then be the mean absolute deviation of this random variable. It also says that if you have to choose the order, should I do 2 before 1 or 1 before 2? If you have two different distributions, you should place the one uh, first that has the smallest mean absolute deviation. Not the smallest variance, but the smallest mean absolute deviation. Okay. So the traditional approach is this linear programming. All right. So you can write down the dynamics. It's very simple. The add time of the first service is E1, which is T1. The start time of the second one is the maximum of the add time and the appointment time, and the same for the other systems. Right? So um, then you can, once you have found those times, you can find the, the, the idle times, of course, and the waiting time. So for example, idle time of two is the start time of two minus the end of the, the first one. Right? Okay. So the cost is this linear combination. So you say we want to minimize the cost over the appointment times subject to the constraints. Now people notice, oh, this is a nonlinear system, right? There's a max. But it's, so the, the trick is simply to say, well, we will replace this max by saying that S2 should be bigger than those two terms. So now the constraints are linear. The, the objective function is linear. It's a simple linear programming problem. So now things are, are stochastic. So what people have done is they say, okay, we have uh, we'll do a sum over the probabilities of the different values. So again, everything is linear. So in fact, so it should be relatively easy. The problem, of course, is the size. Very quickly, the problem blows up because if you have m possible values for n different uh, durations, m to the n quickly becomes unmanageable. So even if you, if you solve this, and many people have to solve this, uh, you, you do not track the changes in the distribution very well. So your solution that was good for the last three years may not be very good now because, in fact, you have not captured those trends. So what do we do? We do a gradient algorithm like everybody does, right? So learning has become either linear regression or gradient algorithm. So <laughs> we do a gradient algorithm. So how does it work? Well, so let's look at this, this example. Right? So the, you recall the unit cost, idle time is one, delay is alpha, over time is beta. So what you do is that you look at one particular realization, the st stochastic gradient, right? one particular realization of those times, and you see what would happen if I were to increase my appointment time A2 by epsilon. What would happen? Well, I would increase this idle time but I would dis decrease this one. So locally, the partial derivative is zero. Right? So, so the algorithm will not move A2. The gradient algorithm will not move A2, which may not be a good idea, because intuitively you know that A2 should be brought closer to this time. You do it for A3, you say, what happens if I increase A3 a little bit? I will increase the ideal time, so the derivative is one. Right? So, I will go in the opposite direction of the gradient. I want to decrease my cost. So A3 will decrease and tend to be closer to the end time of the second one. A2 will not move. So you end up with this, this algorithm, right, where A3 changes. A2 does not move. It's stuck. But you can twist the algorithm a little bit. And the idea is to add a multiple of the sum of the start times. So you add a multiple of the start, start time of the second procedure or the second service and the third one. And by doing that, suddenly your algorithm will not be stuck. So by increasing this, right, you will increase one idle time, right? So you will end up with a, a positive gradient. So it will tend to bring everything down, right? So a simple variation. 
OK, so the key idea then is stochastic gradient descent. This little calculations that we, we did by looking at the gradient on one particular realization is a form of perturbation analysis. Right? You just trace the effect on one particular simulation of a little change, not by redoing the simulation, but just by tracking what would happen if you were to change it. So that used to be called infinitesimal perturbation analysis. So, for example, if you change A to a little bit, you can trace the cost very simply. So the algorithm will find very quickly the gradient, and then you will do the, the gradient, stochastic gradient, right? the classical stochastic gradient. And what happens when you do this? Well, you get a, a very efficient algorithm that uses only the data. There is no model. There is a model for the dynamics, but no model for the data. Uh, it's efficient because you, you read the gradient without doing any effort, right? It's, it's systematic. And you can show that the problem is luckily convex and uniformly Lipschitz in the appointment times. So you know that it will, it will converge to the optimal solution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why is efficiency important? Because why not solve big linear programs? Well, you want to explore many scenarios. So for example, you want to change the different ordering of the, of the, the services. And you, in practice, you have not one operating room, you have many operating rooms, and you can dispatch patients to the free operating room. When you do this, unfortunately, you lose convexity. But, uh, okay. So, uh, anyway, so this just shows that it works, right? I don't need to convince you of uh, convexity by doing simulations, but okay. Now the real time scheduling. So this is a little. Why this is convex? Oh, it's a classical problem in queuing theory if you think of Lorentz equations. It's a max sum of sums. So everything's, every, all the, the end times will be convex, right? And now you look at, uh, so the idle times become convex. The, the overtime is the, the duration of the day. Um, you, you look at the total processing time. It, it depends on the idle times. And therefore, uh, it becomes convex also, right? So it's, it's Luckily, it's convex. Now, the, the real-time scheduling. So if you think about a concrete situation, right? You, you, you are doing surgeries in one operating room. The first surgery happens to take only one hour instead of six. Maybe you have to close the patient. And the problem is too serious. You cannot operate or whatever, right? Then you have done your static appointments for the subsequent cases, assuming a long typical duration. If you do not react to the fact that the first case was much shorter than planned, you, can, you will waste a lot of time. So you have to react in real time. So this is the idea of real time scheduling. Okay, so for example, say that the first service is either one hour or five hours with equal probability. How do you choose a second appointment time? Well, you would typically choose the average, right? Or the medium, if it's uniform, right? Uh, so, in that case, half of the time you will have a cost of two because you are idle, right? And the other half of the time you will have a cost of two because you, you of the delay, right? Now, what, can you, what else can we do? Well, let's say that you need a warning time of one hour for the second customer. So, what should you do? Well, if the first procedure ends at after one hour, you want the patient, the next patient, so you should come. There will be a delay, of course. You will have to wait for the patient for one hour. If the first procedure is very long, what should you do? Well, you should not warn him at time one. You know by time one that the first procedure is not finished. You don't know uh, when it will finish, but you know, well, it's likely to finish at five, so you will warn him at time four, so that he will arrive, he will arrive exactly on time. Okay, so this is a trivial example, but it shows that a good policy that will save a lot of time is a stopping time based on what you have seen so far, right? Now, this is a particular policy, it's a particular parametric policy that says after some time, if the first procedure is not finished, I will warn the, the patient, the second patient. If it finishes, I should warn him then. So it's a particular, it's not necessarily the optimum 
uh, adaptive policy, but it's a simple parametric policy. Okay, so it's a similar story. So the idea is that uh, you want the patient, the patient two, at the minimum of the end of the first procedure and sometime X. X becomes a parameter in your policy, and then you will try to optimize over X. How will we optimize over X? We'll use a gradient algorithm, right? So this is an example of what happens. The function of uh, the, the cost, alpha, of the waiting time. If you use a real-time policy, you optimize over X. This is the optimum value of X. This is the optimum cost. If you do a static appointment, these are the costs that you find. The optimum static appointment, the optimum cost. So you can save quite a bit by being reactive, not surprisingly, right? So it's, it's fairly clear that the real-time policy will do better than the static policy. What is less clear is how to parameterize the policy so that you can find the optimum within this class of policies. So this is another example, right? So the, the key idea is that if uh, one procedure is delayed, since the appointment time of the third one depends on the start time of the second one, when the second one slides, automatically the third one, the appointment time will slide as well. So you will avoid a cascade of delays that we see in, a, in typical static appointments. Right. Right. So the formulation, again, is that one particular customer, number three, will be worn during a previous service, not necessarily the preceding one, maybe a few before. Right? So you have to choose during which service will I warn patient or the customer number three? And then once, maybe it's one, right? Then I have to choose the parameter, which is this waiting time the before I trigger the warning, right? Okay, so, so that's how you do it. So the algorithm, okay, stochastic gradient descent with perturbation analysis. You trace the effect of modifying those X's a little bit. If I increase the X on this particular realization, what will be the impact on the waiting times and on the delays? And you can do it in, in one shot, so you have a very easy calculation of the, of the gradient. And then you do your stochastic gradient. Uh, I think we are at five minutes. You're very generous with me. <laughs> so the goal was to optimize appointments. So we use a data-driven approach stochastic gradient descent with infinitesimal perturbation analysis. So for static appointments, we, we saw how to do it. It's convex, it's nice, everything works well. In practice, it really works. The dynamic appointments adapt to variability. It limits the cascades of delays. That's the first order effect. Unfortunately, you do not have uh, conve global convexity for this problem. That's unfortunate. So when you run your algorithm, you have to try different starting points and then find the best one. Right? So that's unfortunate, unfortunate. But, but it's quite tractable on reasonable size problems. So we are looking at uh, situations where you have maybe up to 10 surgeries per operating room. So, so the algorithm works. Thank you. Time for questions. Uh, is it possible to uh, extend the real-time scheduling algorithm for multiple operating rooms. I mean, that might be a simpler problem than when you're trying to do static scheduling for multiple operating rooms. Yes, so you can do it for uh, multiple operating rooms, but the problem is that if you dispatch patients based on the, the end times in the different operating rooms, you lose its convexity. Right, so, so you can, so what you would do, you have the schedule that has been provided by the, the scheduler, right, of the hospital, and you know which, how many cases you have. And then you try to, to assign them to the different op operating rooms, and you, you simulate what would happen by sampling from previous durations, and you use your gradient algorithm that will tell you, okay, when to, dis when to warn, when to dispatch. But um, again, you lose convexity, so it becomes complex. How open are they to implementing your algorithms? Not very open. <laughs> what are uh, the? <laughs> the problem is that this requires real-time uh, signaling of events. So the nurse in the operating room has to tell, she, she has to click on the tablet saying, this surgery is almost done. Right? And this goes then to the system that will then warn everybody. Right? 
that turns out to be a big deal. But the nurses do not want to have to do extra work, right? So it will take us a while before we can turn around some hospitals to those new techniques. It's surprising, right? The UPS uh, driver will scan every package that he drops. He will track in real time what he does. But inside the operating room, they do, after the fact, they do what they call charting. So they report on what they did during the day, but there's a big lag in when they do it. And sometimes it's fudged. Uh, maybe in Switzerland it's not like this, but in, in the US, in most hospitals, it is like that. Yes. yes. Can this be extended to when you're oh. not, you have both timing windows and a call? So if the plumber tells you between 8 and 12, and I'll give you a one hour notice. The yeah, so the, you tell them, so for the plumber or for the, the patient, you say, your surgery will be in the afternoon, be ready, be, start to be ready around noon, right? But we will tell you when you should come. And then they, they, cannot, they can leave the house maybe at 2.30 instead of noon. So yeah, yeah you combine those yeah. ideas. Because then you, you can be late for just the time window or late for the... Uh, hour for which they got the, so the, the delay is compared to when they are supposed to come, right? So you tell them to come at noon, and then it's the delay after noon that, that counts, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Somehow you're able to exchange the derivative and the expectation? Yes, because everything is uh, bounded, uniformly bounded, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not very dominated convergence works, <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.